same day, the high bridge is open after 15 months. Waited for it to open more than me. <laughs> but, uh, and, and by the way, for those of you from the west side who kept coming to Waldman during those 15 months when it was about a half an hour drive, <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you so much. much. Yeah, thank thank you. Really I really appreciate it. We almost considered reopening Williams Ferry down below. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just to get folks out there. Yeah. Yeah. Who, who made it to the ribbon cutting? Hey. Yeah, was it fun? Hey. Is it fun? Okay. Cool. On this side, all that happened was they put up road close signs, and we had a bunch of irritated people doing cookies in front of the road close signs. Um, so, no, we wanted to hold this celebration really for both communities, but especially for folks on this end of the bridge who, who might have missed out on the celebrations on the other end, and really to connect the two again. That's really what this is about, is a celebration of reconnected communities. Part of that is also kind of reflecting back on our own history as connected communities. And so I, I'm, I'm tremendously honored to, to be able to speak uh, to you all along with Jim Sezevich. I He probably needs no introduction whatsoever to anybody in this room. Uh, but as all of you probably know, Jim is a lifelong St. Paul historian. He is the expert on the history of St. Paul's neighborhoods and their individual structures. Nobody knows more about the building history of St. Paul than Mr. Sezebe. So I just want to give him a hand and acknowledge yeah. Yeah. The other thing I want to say is this is, this is a bit of a, uh, uh, oh, I don't know how I should describe it to him, but I put together the photos, and I didn't really even describe to Jim what they were. So it's going to be a bit of a stumpy expert here, in a sense. Um, so, yeah. so Jim and I are going to kind of share the floor, uh, but it doesn't have to be just the two of us. There's a lot of expertise in this room. My goodness, I'm looking around and I'm intimidated, in fact, by some of the... Is Steve Osmond here, former site director from Fort Snelling. Welcome, oh, Steve. Steve. Uh, hey, Steve. Hey. John Eust, uh, a lifelong historian, architect, formerly Minnesota Historical Society, and the project architect for this site is here with us as well. Uh, Mark Redman back there, yeah, you've probably seen yeah, Mark on yeah, Old St. Paul, and uh, Mark knows an awful lot about everything from Bible history to St. Paul history and digging privies on top of it. Uh, Youngblood, I'm sorry. Yes. I'm sorry. Um, to people that were involved in the project here, I've got Tom Dangler, one of our chief carpenters in this project, drinking out of an amazing meal bowl that, that Tom carved here in the center of the table. So uh, welcome to you all. Uh, Let's, let's get started on this. Um, I, I, um, I call this a bridge to the past um, because that's really what the high bridge represents to us. It's a connection not only of communities but a connection to our own history. And I want to start this by reflecting on what the city was like originally when it was disconnected. The early 1850s, the mid-1850s in St. Paul, there was no bridge in St. Paul until the Wabashaw Bridge was constructed in 1859. So we were separated by a river, and this is the city in that era, as depicted in E.F. Upton's panoramas, taken in the, the summer of 1857, when he literally clambered with his camera equipment to the top of the cupola at the St. Paul Courthouse, and took a series of brilliant panoramas, long time exposure, looking all around the city. One interesting thing about these photographs is you won't see any people. Can anyone guess why in the middle of a bustling city in the, in the heat of the summer, broad daylight, you would not see a single individual in these images? Slow, Slow exposure. exposure. That's Slow exactly exposure. right. Because the exposure time was so long that any humans would have been blurred as they walked a few steps during the time the shutter was open on the camera. Occasionally, you'll see an old horse in these pictures, but, but not much else. Um, the river was more of a disconnector at this point. It was a connector to points down south, certainly to Kansas City, St. Louis, New Orleans, but it was not much of a connector going crosswise. West St. Paul, nascent West St. Paul, which by the way was chartered as, as its own city in 1858, and had a population of over 400 individuals by that time, mostly German and Irish, uh, and, and many of, much of the native population remained as well. But that population was largely disconnected from the city of St. Paul, with the exception of what was the first ferry, uh, Jim? 
in St. Paul. John Irvine, who was a, a resident of this neighborhood, one of the pioneer residents of this neighborhood, came, who came from our uh, New England uh, settlement, came here and brought a load of groceries and a plaster by trade, uh, came and opened a ferry right here, connecting just this side of Harriet Island, just this side and connecting us with the west side. So the first ferry across the river was John Irvine, followed by uh, James D. Williams. Uh, his wonderful ad here for his ferry in uh, May of 1860. Um, uh, very, very busy man, made a lot of money, he was living in Mendota, and he and his wife Mary actually operated the ferry together. Uh, they had uh, three children uh, that were all fairly small, and sadly, this man who operated the ferry uh, between Fort Snelling and our landmass of the reserve township just west of where we're sitting, um, he died uh, six years after this ad. He was murdered uh, near his ferry. But ferries weren't perfect connectors because, in short, ferries cost money. These individuals weren't operating nonprofits. These were burgeoning businesses. And the tolls for ferry crossings, even in relative terms in the 1850s, were, were quite costly. It prevented a lot of commerce across the river. I want to point out one other ferry landing. Steve, I, I wonder if you could do, do you have any information or detail about the Port Snelling landing that you'd like to share? Well, there were two ferries there. There was the Minnesota River Ferry, and there was the Mississippi River Ferry. And uh, they both uh, kind of fell under the business uh, umbrella of Franklin Steel, who seemed to manage just about everything down in that part of the military reservation. The Fort Snelling Ferry closed in, or the uh, Mississippi River Ferry closed in 1878, 79. But the uh, Minnesota River Ferry didn't close until 1926, when the Minnesota Bridge was put in place. Now, one thing I want to point out, this is from the Andreas map of 1874, the Ramsey County map. But one thing I love about this particular depiction is it shows the old Fort Road, which became Stewart Avenue, after the platting of the new Fort Road, or West 7th Street, as we call it today, in 1860. Prior to 1860, though, people would have left downtown St. Paul on the old Fort Road, which basically followed the natural contour of the river bluff and curved around to the ferry landing down here. And actually, the building that you're in, you've probably heard me say this before, is a vestigial marker of that old Fort Road because that original Fort Road, the Bluff Road, as it, ent as it left downtown St. Paul and blended its way through Leach's Edition, came right in front of this building to join again with the Bluff Line and running westward. So a couple of photographs of the Fort Snelling Ferry gives you a sense of the operation of these businesses. You see the windlasses that are coiling rope with large wooden levers to run the ferry across. Even horses loaded on this one. So they were carriage crossings, carriage fare. And this is a Mississippi River Ferry and the Minnesota River Ferry. Well, as I said, um, we were disconnected, but in 1859, the Wabashaw Bridge was first constructed. This was the first bridge in downtown St. Paul. But this too wasn't quite the connector it could have been because this was not a public project. This was a chartered private business. And the investors were allowed to charge tolls for the crossing on the bridge. It improved the economy greatly of the west side and of the bridgehead on the east side, the St. Paul side. In fact, this is a picture of the, uh, the crossing, what was then a three-way crossing the head of Wabasha leading to the Wabasha Bridge, Bent Street going down the hill to your right, and Third Street, what is now known as Kellogg, going straight in the center of the picture into the horizon. These bridgeheads became incredibly important economic engines of the city, gathering places. Bridge Square was one of the most significant gathering places in St. Paul. And so, this, Joe, did you want to? You look like you were going to say something. Go ahead. <laughs> just, just to give you a perspective again for, for today, do you know where you are? We're talking about Bridge Square, so Wabashaw, Kellogg, the uh, hotel, 
the former Hilton Hotel, which became what the, uh, the you know, the Intercontinental or whatever they call it. Courthouse in this corner. The river is to the right hand side of the park. Right, the river's here. Yes. And, and here is actually the Kellogg Mall today, where, where the uh, block standing here. And then Second Street, just on the other side of the building there. Second Street, sometimes known as Bench. So you would have had all the commerce of the lower landing, which was about a third busier than the upper landing where we are, coming up off of this street into the bridge square, all the commerce of what's now Kellogg Boulevard or Third Street running along this street, and then Wabasha running running that way. So and everyone in the city, everyone in the city, from the day you arrived, you would have known where Bridge Square was. Busiest, most important intersection in the entire city, and no wonder our, our Rames County Courthouse stands up right at that intersection eventually. Well, other bridges than St. Paul. In 1880, a bridge is constructed going to the east side, up East 7th Street to Dayton's Bluff. Jim, I think you've... <laughs> so, so, so poorly constructed, by the way, and so cheaply constructed that within a year after its completion, the St. Paul Fire Department said, sorry, folks, Dayton's Bluff does not have fire protection anymore. We're not taking our fire rigs. <laughs> We're not taking our fire rigs and, and a big problem. And so when you see the beautiful stone bridge that's on that site today, you'll understand. The Fort Snelling Bridge, constructed in 1880. Uh, this replaces the ferry in the photographs that you saw earlier. So we're still not up to the date of construction of the high bridge, but to give you a sense of what's happening on the other end of the Wabasha Bridge, back to that point of economic development coinciding with bridgeheads. On the west side, which is uh, really the south side of the bridge in an odd way, St. Paul's geography can be so disoriented, can it? Drunken Irishman is not Oh, <laughs> well, that, that too, that too. <laughs> But look at all the commerce, and this is where a city is already grown. I didn't tell the last, the ending of the, the story of the city of West St. Paul. It was actually dissolved in 1862. They were at near bankruptcy, and the county dissolved the city, took back control. At that time in history, that was part of Dakota County. So, uh, and, and five, uh, nine years later, when this photograph is taken, Dakota County adopted the annexation uh, statute that allowed all of West St. Paul to Annapolis to become part of Ramsey County and part of St. Paul. What year did you say? In 1874, we annexed all of West St. Paul, we, St. Paulites, I'm being a little ethnocentric there, uh, annexed all of West St. Paul up to Annapolis to the city. And, and it's an interesting question, it's that that uh, is just two years after our city grew for the first time since 1854. Our appropriated city in 1854 remained in place without any additions except for Cone Park, which happened in 1872. Uh, and the park itself was created in 1872, but we expanded our boundaries for the first time after the Civil War in 1872. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead here a slide because this figure plays hugely in the history of the High Bridge. This is Robert A. Smith. And folks, we just don't give enough credit for certain people in our history. This is one of those forgotten figures in St. Paul history that everyone should know who Robert A. Smith is. He is who Smith Avenue is named after. In fact, the street in front of Waldman used to be called Forbes, but when the High Bridge was constructed, it the High Bridge itself was known as the Smith Bridge, and uh, Forbes Avenue was renamed as uh, Smith Avenue. Mr. Smith came to St. Paul in 1853. You see the litany in his resume there, private secretary to Governor Gorman, territorial Governor Gorman, became territorial librarian, county treasurer, uh, was elected to the city council, became city council president, was a legislature, and in the, in the Minnesota legislature, both in the House and in the Senate. And during his term in the Senate, from 1886 to 1890, he simultaneously served as mayor of the city. So this individual is sitting on key committees of the Minnesota legislature, including the Street and, Build, uh, and Bridge Building Committee, and in 1887 proposes the construction of the High Bridge. Why? Mainly for economic development purposes. And I want to go back to the previous slide and point out what's the, the geography of the west side is incredibly important to the high bridge. Jim, can you point out the, the, the flats of the west side first? Over, over uh, 
the fire engine. The All of the flats here. below, basically, these this is a this is an indication of high bluffs, almost impenetrable bluffs if you're in horse and wagon. But these are all the flats, as Jim pointed out, and that those that was the area of, of the most intense development at the the opposite side of the Wabash Street Bridge that you saw in the other photograph. This whole area above the bluff lands was nothing but farmland. It was the least developed, but most ripe for development parcel in the entire city. Now recall, newly annexed to the city of St. Paul. Uh, and, and that got people thinking, how could we propel the development of that area? And the answer was, let's build a bridge, bluff to bluff. The next question, though, became, where do we, where do we build the bridge? Well, the, the Minnesota legislature approved the construction of a bridge uh, up to a cost of 300000 in July of 1887. And then the city, uh, the, the very next day, the city appointed a committee to consider areas to build. The first proposed bridge, and I'm just going to name these streets, Jim, if you can point these out. Uh, the first site they proposed was Ohio Street at Isabel crossing over to Sherman Street at Ryan. So if this would have been a little bit farther to the east, Ohio Street, Ohio today. and then crossing over basically to Irvine Park. This would have rammed right through Irvine Park. And how dramatically would this neighborhood have developed had that happened? The second proposal is again Ohio Street to Elman Ryan, a little bit farther west just at the north, north end. Yourself. And then the third proposal was even more radical, Cherokee Avenue at King Street crossing over to Dowsman, which would have brought the high bridge much, much farther to the west and would have left this neighborhood fairly stranded, stranded as it had historically been. Uh, well, we all know what happened in the end. The bridge was approved running from what was then a small, ill-used street called Mohawk, now Smith Avenue South, running to Forbes Street, now Smith Avenue North. The name changes get a little bit confusing, but that was the final direction the bridge proposed, and here you see it under construction in 1889. The, the story of the selection of the contractor for this is kind of fascinating, too, because actually the council took bids from two different uh, construction outfits. One of them was Keystone Bridge Company, which I think is kind of ironic, because now we have Keystone Community uh, running our, our West 7th Community Center, so that's a little, little coincidence. But it was Keystone Bridge Company owned by Andrew Carnegie, none other than Andrew Carnegie, right? Carnegie was still in the railroad business, but switching over to the steel industry would become the wealthiest man in America, but not yet at this point in history. Carnegie delivered a series of presentations. The same bridge was being proposed both in St. Louis as well as in St. Paul. And in the St. Louis presentations, which became very influential to the St. Paul council members, Carnegie made the point that wrought iron was a much better material than cast iron. Cast iron was often used for bridge building in those days. Because cast iron would shatter. And if a steamboat were to run at high water against one of these uh, supporting piers and strike the cast iron, you could have entire, the, the, the entire bridge collapse virtually. Uh, one of the council members had just struck a cast iron lamp post that day coming to the meeting. And it resonated with them immediately. <laughs> what happened was it shattered like glass. And that happens especially in cold weather. So that's how Carnegie got the uh, got the project. Uh, they bid by over twenty nine thousand more than the next the second place bidder, which became a huge scandal that actually propelled the defeat of Robert A. Smith in the next election. I won't go into that detail, but but Carnegie got the bid, and we had a high bridge built of wrought iron. Uh, Jim, do you want to talk a little bit about what's beneath the bridge here? Because this, yeah, this, this, this is really fun. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, something that was uh, con confusion for decades, literally probably maybe even a century uh, after it existed. Uh, people talk about the flats and the Bohemian flats. Well, the Bohemian flats are in Minneapolis. They're not in St. Paul. But they, they assume that all of the Czech uh, immigrants, Bohemian immigrants that came to the neighborhood lived on the flats. 
they did. They were too smart. They were highly educated. Many of them, they wouldn't live in a floodplain. <laughs> and, and they had no way of building it up at that time. So, so they did live down here for the longest time. They actually lived just south of Goodridge Street here, up on this windswept bluff. It was a rock shelf. And you headed towards the high bridge here. When you um, reached Goodrich, it dropped 20 feet at that point. 20 feet. So big rock shelf. Nine acres total, owned by a Jewish businessman in New York who owned thousands of acres of property throughout the Midwest, but a lot of it right here in Minnesota, a lot of it in St. Paul. A guy named Isaac Bernheimer, and he took that rock shelf and rented it to the Bohemians from the late 1850s all the way up to 1880. And in 1880, he said, it's now too valuable. I'm going to build houses, have your people build houses there, sell it for building lots. And a lot of fill was put in, and they were pushed out. And some of them ended up on the flats, forced down into the floodplain. But uh, about a thousand people were living in these nine acres when they were evicted in 1880, and literally a stone's throw from where we're sitting. And imagine, with all those numbers, how many were children? <laughs> they were living right at the edge of that bluff, which had been spliced away by the railroads. So here is the beginning of the settlement on the river flats, which grew and grew and changed in population. There were Danish, there were Norwegians, there were Poles, but then the greatest number, starting in the early 1890s, Italians, the Italian levy. This is what we know today as Little Italy. And if you go down to the site today, and um, to today this is mostly a power plant on this side of the bridge, and on the opposite side of the bridge, you see all the modern condos and apartments that were built in recent days on the site of the old scrapyard on the former site of Little Italy. So immigrant settlement for nearly 100 years on that site. A few other comments about the construction of the bridge that I forgot to mention. Um, Interestingly, the bridge is not riveted. It was constructed with a, a technology called pin and eye bar that was designed not only to be easily assembled on site without the use of mechanical riveters, those were quite expensive and heavy at the time and difficult for use in bridge building, but they also allowed for expansion of the bridge joints, expansion and contraction with the temperature, which was important. Uh, the bridge uses 3,000 tons of wrought iron at the time the bridge was built, there was more cumulative material in wrought iron and in stonework at the piers than was used in all of all the other bridges in the Twin Cities combined. Uh, so this was quite a structure, and if I haven't mentioned it already, the second uh, largest bridge in the country, both in terms of height and length, the longest and tallest bridge in the country, can anyone guess at this time in 1889? Brooklyn Bridge. Brooklyn Bridge, yep. That's absolutely right. Um, the, this had uh, actually relatively refined pedest pedestrian access. Uh, there was an eight-foot uh, pedestrian walkway, eight-foot wide, on either side of the bridge that was planked with three-inch white pine. And it's, I, there, there are people in this room that probably, not to date anyone in this room, but there are people that probably remember walking the bridge on that wood. Do, John, do you? And I've heard stories of so yeah. like gaps down. Yeah. Yeah. down the road. Uh, the other interesting thing about the, the bridge decking was in order to make it quieter for horse and carriage, and this is an era where we have steel rimmed carriages and horses that are mostly uh, shoed with, with, uh, with horseshoes, uh, they used the butt ends of cedar wood blocks laying in tar. And the cedar was deemed to be a quieter surface. The problem with cedar, of course, well, not of course, but they soon found out, was that if it rained, or certainly in an early morning frost, it became deadly slippery. And in fact, there are stories of lines of carriages and horses on either side of the bridge waiting for the morning sunlight to melt the frost off the bridge before they could transgress the bridge. So. Kind of, kind of fun facts. Uh, by the way, it was originally painted. It's too bad black and white photography robs our entire sense of the color of the past. I, I'd like to remind people, even when you're in this room, these are the original colors of this room. Periwinkle blue, 
green, you know, gold floor. This is a very colorful era, and the hybrid was no exception. Bright red lead paint, glistening red. Early postcard images show that. They're, they're hand colored, but they're trying to depict that, that redness. It must have been a beautiful structure. Okay. Communities on either side looking at this now. Um, Jim, I'll let you talk about West 7th. Well, we're standing about we're standing about halfway up uh, the hill to Summit Avenue, Pleasant Avenue, in the foreground, Ramsey Street, right here, an old row house that's at uh, near Ramsey and Smith. And uh, the perspective is odd. You know, you see the bridge crossing, but uh, all of the streets, the way we're laid out here in the Upper Town neighborhood, old Upper Town neighborhood, is, is confusing. So, so you can see the approach to the bridge. You would think maybe here somewhere, but this is Seventh and Smith right here, the little triangular. Uh, park that's on the um, north side of the street. There's a towered uh, commercial block there. It was built right about the same time as the bridge. And so going down, this house was at the corner of Smith and Forbes, built in the 1850s. And so going down towards the bridge here, here's a business block that sat exactly where DeGidio's parking lot is today, three-story business block, Dawson's block. This row house right behind the videos is still there, right? that row house, that's easy to spot. These houses were just rehabbed and sold on Ford Street in the foreground here. But there's the approach to the bridge. This is the year the bridge opened. This photograph was taken within, within the year that the bridge opened. You know, as I see, it says 1891 here at Haynes. So it's two years after the opening of the bridge in, in May of 1889. But um, I always thought of this as 1890 photograph. I, I own the original of this photograph, by the way. <laughs> and so, um, uh, one of the originals. I'm sure there are some more around, but I, I uh, found it. But, but a great shot of this neighborhood back then. And, and to show you where you're sitting tonight, would be just right down here, kind of right behind these buildings and trees and stuff. Very hard to see. There's other images. Here's a cupola house that, that sat right behind. Uh, Digidios on McBowl Street. So, if I could ask you, Jim, to point out some of the beautification efforts that have transformed West Seventh by the 1950s. <laughs> <laughs> well, to put it in perspective here, just to show you where we're sitting, uh, we have we have uh, in the room with us as a guest uh, a person that owns this house right here, uh, the. Um, Louis Hill House on Summit Avenue. This is the J. Hill House, the Louis Hill House. And looking from the top of the